Hi, I'm Grace Lodick, and this is Educating Ourselves in These Difficult Times on ThinkTech Hawaii. I am a communications major at Hawaii Pacific University and interned here at ThinkTech. In my series, I cover the unique challenges presented by coronavirus and how it has impacted education. In today's episode, we will be delving into the challenges presented by coronavirus on educators, the shift of a college classroom experience to an online setting, and the anthropological significance and impact of pandemics. Today, my special guest is Dr. Rob Borofsky, Director of the Center for a Public Anthropology, Professor of Anthropology at Hawaii Pacific University, and founding editor of the California series in public anthropology. He will be sharing how coronavirus has impacted his role as an educator and how anthropology can be an important tool to understand the evolution and future of pandemics. Thank you for being a guest on my show today, Dr. Borofsky. You're welcome, Grace. So for today's program, for our first segment, I'd like to focus on the impact that coronavirus has had on educators. And then for the second half of our show, I'd like to focus on the anthropological significance of this pandemic and what anthropology can teach us about global issues, particularly COVID-19. So to start off our show today, could you share, us, share with us what have been some of the greatest challenges of being an educator during this difficult time? I'm perhaps not the best person to talk to you about all these difficult challenges and sufferings because I'm enjoying myself. Um, to understand there's deep problems with education in the United States and around the world. Um, in the United States, you have a book that came out in 2011 called Academically Adrift and other studies confirmed it, that about a third of the students who um, go to college for four years come out without him having made any improvements in critical thinking, problem solving, or effective writing. That means they went in, they had a good time and so forth, but they did not get a real sense of um, education. And so we have, and these have been known for since 2011, but there's a sense that um, educators sort of talk about changing, and they've been certainly talking about all this change, they haven't changed very much. They, smile at you when they talk about change as if that would be enough. Um, so the coronavirus is a very traumatic experience, no doubt about that, for a whole lot of students and administrators. A lot of schools are going to lose considerable sums of money. A lot of students aren't going to go back. They're going to have to transform what they do on, online versus in-person classes. And so this is, at the same time, a deep trauma is also, I would suggest, an opportunity. How can you remake education in this stressful, difficult time to really help students learn more? Not just teach, which is what often happens with um, teachers focusing on how they teach students. The idea is, can you help facilitate learning among students? And so, for me at least, I've enjoyed using Zoom in the classroom um, with actually Grace and doing these um, into actions in which we try and work together as a learning community. So my basic answer is, it's going to be stressful, it's going to be traumatic, but it may be a turn to the better when we recover. Who knows, but I would hope good would come out of this trauma. I definitely hope so as well. That's definitely a shocking statistic that only one out of three college students really get anything out of their college education. Um, what do you rest, <laughs> don't get too much, but they at least get something. So what do you think this pandemic has revealed to us about what college students are really getting out of their education? And how do you think that education will be transformed as a result of this pandemic? Okay. One, it's not clear what students will get out of it. We never know. Um, it's not clearly viewed as a major crisis, which it is. It's a very, very serious problem for a number of students. Um, it goes from the minor, not being able to celebrate your graduation with all your probably, well, your cohort, your friends and family, to really how are they gonna get through? What are they gonna gain? Um, asynchronic education, which is you know, just get in, you do the assignments versus synchronic, which is like this in Zoom, um, are different and they give different things. But the question really is, can they adapt to change? Can they improve? And they haven't to date. 
Um, we will see. It's an opportunity. And what would it look like? I personally would like to see more internships, um, like Northeastern University, where you go out and you work in the community as part of your course load. Um, I would like to see education for what is real. To quote a, quote a famous educator, John Dewey from the early 1900s. Um, and I think what you really want is to explore how students can learn more effectively. They pay a great deal of money to facilitate a great deal of academic bureaucrats. Um, I'm not sure we can do it more efficiently, more effectively, if we focus not on teaching, but on learning. And so it's an open question. Can we focus on students really learning what they need for meaningful lives and careers? I definitely agree with that. I think that adaptability and learning how to learn effectively definitely are key skills that will carry a student far beyond just the classroom itself. With the shift and to you need certain, I'm sorry, but you need a certain resilience. For sure. This is really a tough time for people, no doubt. It's going to get much worse in terms of economic. But can you have the resilience to find opportunities in this difficult time? But I interrupted you, Mike. So with the shift to online learning, what experiences would you say have been lost or enhanced for college students? What you've lost is teacher's comfort zone. What you've lost is student's comfort zone. Students in these lecture, large lecture halls, like in University of Michigan, or University of California system, they go in, they appear to type, they do whatever, and they leave and it's not clear what they've learned. And teachers just lecture. And there's a famous movie, uh, video called Declining by Degrees. And it talks about teachers saying, she has a bag in, an unwritten bag in the students. You don't ask much of me, and I don't ask much of you. And they just go on through the emotions. Maybe that could change. Maybe teachers would focus now on helping students learn. That would be great. I definitely agree. It's really sad to me today that so many college professors just take advantage of their position, just speak their, to their students, but don't really care about what they get away from the lecture per se, or what skills they're developing as a result of their investment into college and academics. Um, you mentioned earlier that this and pandemic... Say, I view it as a little immoral in the teachers' part and in the universities' part, but it's pervasive throughout the Western world. You mentioned that this pandemic has definitely caused educators to get out of their comfort zone. So what are some lessons that you've learned as a result of the shift to online learning? It can be fun. I never taught online learning before because I didn't like this asynchronic of just doing assignments and students passing them in. But doing Zoom in class, it's fun. You interact with them. You, it's not the same as doing it in person, but it's differences, but it's fun. How would I know that learning, uh, teaching online, and having students learn online, interacting with them could be fun? That's what I've learned. It can be fun. So I'm sorry. I'm not here to complain. I definitely agree that Zoom learning has been fun. It's especially been a privilege to be a student of your anthropology class. You've definitely kept class very entertaining and engaging. And I definitely still feel like I'm getting just as much out of my education in your class as I was in the classroom with you. Thank you, I appreciate but that. Overall, what do you think the impact of this shift has been on students? Have you had to make any specific accommodations for curriculum? Have you noticed increased stress in students? Or are they perhaps struggling in areas that they weren't previously? I think students are struggling. Some can respond to change better than others. But um, you have to have a sense of compassion for students. Uh, maybe always, but certainly now, as they try and adjust to a whole new situation. They're going to face a really difficult economic environment, and they're not sure what their lives are going to be like after college. They may not have been sure beforehand, but now they're really unsure what it's going to be like. And so they're trying to figure these out. I think what the main adjustment I've had to do is just have a sense of compassion, more compassion for them. Um, in terms of what I teach, 
I, in the introductory course, I still have eight books. In the advanced course, I have 11 books. These are 300 page books. So one book in the introductory course, The Grace Yourself Had, won the 2016 Nobel Prize for Literature on the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and what it was like. I don't think you should lower your standards here, but I think you should really help students reach these. And it's always, I think, the job of teachers to help students reach these, empower them as learners, empower them as being able to um, think for themselves, feel empowered to really change things, to take their lives and make something of them. I definitely do agree with the philosophy that it's crucial for professors to give students the tools for success. And I definitely think that having compassion during this time is crucial for professors to have because they may not necessarily understand how students may be coping with this pandemic. I think that has definitely been a difficult time for all of us. And I think that it's important for us to understand that each of us do have a different way of coping with global issues such as COVID-19. Overall, how would you say that the online experience has differed from the classroom experience? Some students have complained that perhaps it's less formal or they feel it's not as engaging as being in a classroom. What has it felt like for you? I, I'm sorry to tell you, it's been fun. It's been a whole new experience. Here I am, I'm 76, um, I've taught 37 years at Hawaii Pacific and Hawaii Low University. I never taught an online course before. I'm doing it now and it's fun. It's different. Um, you get students eat it <laughs> eat in front of you. You get to see the children. Sometimes students brought their kids to class because they couldn't find a babysitter. But right now you, it's, it becomes a little less formal because you're focusing on the key themes of the book are the ideas that you're trying to get of a broader nature and trying to be inclusive and having them really think in groups and as individuals. But I don't think I even make too many changes in what I'm doing. And I'm, I apologize for not complaining, as I say, for not suffering and how all these difficult times. When change comes, I think the only thing you can do is have the resilience to respond, to face up to them and adapt. I definitely agree. And is it, it is an inspiration to me that you've continued to have such a positive attitude in spite of this massive global issue and to really enjoy and like bask in the new experiences that you can get out of online learning. I think that definitely <laughs> having that, <laughs> I think that having that spirit definitely does have students to have that spirit and approach towards their classes as well. Um, I definitely think that in our Zoom class, just keeping the same structure that we had before, still allowing us to break out into discussion groups definitely just gives me the comfort of how our class used to be. And it just helps me to create some sense of normalness in my life because I think that many of us feel as though we've lost the sense of normalness um, within uh, COVID-19. I think that some of my other classes, they've definitely changed drastically. It's more difficult to interact with my professor, but in your class, you've definitely done an amazing job of ensuring that um, we still have that interaction with you and that interaction with our classmates. I do think it's my moral responsibility to do that. As a teacher, I'm supposed to help you <laughs> in these difficult times. And there's no doubt they're difficult. Thank you, Dr. Borowski. What teachers are supposed to do? Adapt and help? I agree. In a moment, actually, Dr. Borowski, we will, we will be taking a short break. In the meantime, I'm Grace Lodick, and you are watching Educating Ourselves in These Difficult Times on Think Tech Hawaii with my special guest, Dr. Rob Borowski. We will be back shortly. Aloha, I'm Lillian Kumi, host of Lillian's Vegan World, the show where we talk about veganism and the plant-based diet located in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a vegan chef and cooking instructor, and I have lots of uh, information to share with you about how awesome this plant-based diet is. So do tune in every second Thursday from 1 p.m. Aloha.
Black Hawaii. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, and finding greatness. I feature a wide range of amazing guests who share valuable insights about how going beyond the lines leads to success in everything you do in life. I'm looking forward to you joining me every Monday at 11 a.m. Aloha. Welcome back to Educating Ourselves in These Difficult Times with my guest, Dr. Rob Borofsky, Professor of Anthropology at Hawaii Pacific University and Director of the Center for a Public Anthropology. For the second half of our show, I'd like to focus on what anthropology can teach us about the pandemic and how it can be used as an important tool for us to better understand global issues such as the coronavirus. So for some of our viewers who may not be familiar with the term, what exactly is anthropology? Anthropology is different things to different people. You have to understand, Grace, that in the 1800s, there weren't all these different sociology, political science, economics, and anthropology. These all grew up during the early 1900s when these departments or these subjects went into universities and they had to define themselves as different from one another. And so they form departments. They're artificial because they're different between history and anthropology in the Pacific, to my mind, is nil. Um, between political science and anthropology, they're often the same. We may study different areas, but anthropologists certainly study in Western Europe and political scientists certainly study in Africa and Asia. So I'm not sure there's, that they're really defined, but let me give you a definition an imperfect one. And that is that anthropology studies variations in human beings through time and space. So variations in time is the evolution of human beings, um, Cro-Magnum, Neanderthals, all these things that we're finding out about how old the Homo sapiens are. Um, and space we are on how people live around the world. I myself spent three and almost a half years on a small coral atoll in the middle of the South Pacific, about 2,000 miles south of Kauai called Puka Puka in the Cook Islands. Um, so we speak, live around in diverse places. And the goal is to use the insights of difference. Human beings are one of the special tra traits of all human beings is their diversity. You can say all humans um, share these traits, but diversity is really something they all share. Um, share because they're all different in so many ways. So you want to use diversity, how things are different, to find out through comparison how to have insight into how different people live, what the dynamics of the behavior, and in that way to improve them. So if we take coronavirus, which is a straightforward thing, we see in Sweden, they're ignoring it. And now they're having to suffer for that. We see in Korea, South Korea, um, they're being rather efficient. We see in Germany, they're being efficient. In the United States, not. The United States is, now has the highest death rate of any country for the coronavirus. And you ask why? Why this diversity of human beings mm -hmm. has led to this different result? And so we can study these and we can find better ways to do it. Um, and so that would be an anthropological perspective on dealing with the coronavirus today, mm -hmm. using diversity and comparison to better understand the dynamics at work. Overall, what human behaviors and interactions would you say help to create this perfect storm, per se, for a pandemic like COVID-19 to occur? People aren't so 
interested in changing. They've come to the belief that um, since World War II, particularly, um, the pandemics don't really occur. They occur far away. The Ebola um, epidemic, pandemic occurred far away from us. The flu comes every year. But people have got sort of blasé about these deadly diseases and um, the suffering and disastrous economic consequences and um, people's lives that can occur, um, that people die. And so they they become comfortable with not having them. Mm-hmm. If you go through history, these have made a major difference in the constructions of society throughout the world. The Black Plague transformed Europe um, from a feudal society to this pre-modern era that it went through afterwards. Um, I believe up to 200 million people died. We only have, I think, 150,000 worldwide and we are absolutely petrified that um, of all these things happening. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, we have, I forget your question now, <laughs> I'm sorry, but um, it is it is difficult. Mm-hmm. How would you One say that? Mm-hmm. How would you say that our global environment today differs from past pandemics that tended to be more centralized and didn't spread as quickly? And do you think that our global environment today has led to an inevitability of pandemics like COVID-19 to occur? Well, um, the, let's start with the global environment. Mm-hmm. I believe that um, that has been going on since the Silk Road. I believe the bubonic plague came along the Silk Road to Europe um, from Asia. Um, you may not know why the Spanish flu is called the Spanish flu. I believe it started, that flu epidemic started in Kansas during world training camps for the Americans going overseas. And neither the Allies, nor I think the Germans, really wanted to highlight the disease um, that it was occurring in the front during the war because it was devastating. 50 million people died from it, um, more than died in the fight, actual fighting. So they called it the Spanish flu because Spain was not involved. But clearly, um, in that World War I, but there clearly is a problem here that um, people have been communicating into, in trading with one another for centuries, millennia. Um, so that's come. It's much more common today. But what's the real problem here is that the coronavirus is highly contagious. It just can spread and you do not know from the symptoms immediately whether people have it. And some people may not have it and can be a carrier, not just for the two weeks, but far after that. It's turning into a very complicated issue, um, which will affect about um, opening up the economy again. Mm-hmm. So from an an- answers to that. So from an anthropologist's perspective, what do you think that our future will look like after COVID-19? And do you think that any cultural practices or human behaviors or interactions may change as a result of this pandemic? I'd say absolutely, but I'm not sure what they are. I'm not sure how, this is a really traumatic event. Um, as I said, with students, but with people in general, they're afraid. Um, their normal worlds have been upset they're looking for people to blame um, as a tool of coping rather than just coping. Um, but exactly how, we don't know. Will the economy, international global economy shut down? Somewhat perhaps, but um, this, in the, as you know, the different countries have been trying to close off others from coming in. Um, it's absolutely legal in the United States to stop people from one state going to another, institute Commerce has been part of the United States since its founding. Um, It's part of the Constitution, I believe. Um, Just today, The Guardian from Britain had this wonderful video about how they were appreciating all these immigrants who were helping um, with the National Health um, um, Organization, um, National, whatever it is, NIH. I don't know, it's whatever it's called. and they, it's very nice. They were really appreciating immigrants. They were trying to, it was a very touching movie about how the immigrants should be embraced because they're really helping. 
as you may know, in the um, California valleys, um, or the fruits and vegetables are mostly picked by immigrants. So in one time, people trying to bar set these barriers up against having outsiders. Um, they can't live without these outsiders. And so they'll fluctuate a bit, but it strikes me that um, we have to live with outsiders, whether we like it or not, to have any sense of standard of living, to have any sense of being able to have meaningful lives. I definitely agree with that. So for all of us personally, how can we use anthropology as a tool to better understand global issues such as coronavirus? Anthropology emphasizes studying differences how people engage with these, and what the basis of these differences are. If you compare one difference with another, or how people cope with that difference, such as coronavirus, um, you can get a better sense of how would be a more effective way. Why is Germany more effective at dealing with the coronavirus than France? <laughs> I'm sure people in France have an answer. The people in Germany do, and the Italians have, and the Spanish have, and they all have these national character statements. But these are important to know. Why is um, China, um, why is South Korea better? Uh, we be I believe China did a reasonable job, though those statistics are unclear exactly what they are. Um, somewhat like Colin spent the flu, the American flu, the Spanish flu um, during World War I. Um, but there's a sense of um, using differences, comparison to really understand the broader issues. How are we going to cope with these different things? We have, um, let's think of something. Well, education. International education has been central to funding many American universities and Britain, actually, in Canada as well. And this is going to change. How are they going to try and appeal to other people? How can they really draw people in to collective intellectual community? In the time of stress, it's clearly happening. You have to figure out innovative ways. So what would be really nice is if people become innovative and really try with a sense of compassion rather than hatred to really figure out how they can work with others who are different than themselves to do better things, to build a better world. I definitely Lock agree. Well, I think that- for the long time ago, the times they are changing, They'll always change it. And we use difference in comparison to really improve human life. I definitely agree that anthropology is a tool that we can use in our own personal lives to learn more about the pandemic and to better teach us how we can change our behaviors and how we can shape a future that'll prevent the emergence of a pandemic like COVID-19 again. Um, that's actually all the time that we have for our show today. But I just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Borowski, for being a guest on my show and to thank you for watching Think Tech Hawaii. We hope that today's thank program you. shed some light on the unique challenges presented by coronavirus for educators and how anthropology can be an important tool in understanding the development and future of pandemics. Again, I'm Grace Lodick and see you every other Thursday at noon. Aloha.